Hello, everyone, and welcome to your Talking Over Me. As always, I'm your humble host, Adam Patrick, and today I welcome Stacy, formerly of The Descent, to the show. Now, Stacy for Truth at YouTube and Odyssey. That's Stacy S T A C I E number four Truth, and you can find her at YouTube and Odyssey. Stacy is a practicing attorney, and originally I'd invited her on to talk about some of the court cases that had been going on over the past year, the past 12 months, of course, during the COVID pandemic. But uh, the conversation kind of started and evolved in a direction that I think is uh, way more interesting. And uh, sometimes just having really cool people on who have a lot to offer as far as conversation, you, you end up getting to a better place than what you had planned. So I I'm very glad. Uh, that Stacy came on and did this. I really enjoyed talking to her. I think you're going to get a lot out of this. I know I did. And of course, if you continue to get a lot out of this show, please go ahead and leave me a five-star rating and review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. And of course, continue to subscribe, download, and share the show with your friends. I can, of course, be contacted on any social media platform at I am Adam Patrick. And of course, you're talking over me, Y-E-R, talking no chi, over me at protonmail.com. All right, enough for me. Let's get into it with Stacy from Stacy for Truth. You know, strange, strangely enough, uh, this last year has been, um, I, I would think for a lot of people, when you're talking about win some, lose some, the lose column has been checked off quite a bit. Personally, you know, I've had a really good 12 months other than having to live through, I guess, other people's interpretation of what's going on in the world. You know, I, I don't know a, a super lot about you and you can tell me when you want me to start recording this or not. I mean, I'm recording now, but you can tell me when you want me to clip it. Um, I'm a little curious are you, about, are you recording? Cause it doesn't say like recording. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm always recording when I'm on, but I'll, I'll snip it wherever you just say I'm comfortable starting there. I'll just delete okay. everything prior to that. So we can pre-show until you're comfortable or whatever. Um, okay. But I, I'm, I'm always curious when I, when I talk to people, when I first meet them, what the, you know, kind of the last year was like for them, you know, because people have gone through so many changes. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like we're all test subjects in a mind control experiment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what I feel like. I feel like, like, okay, so I know you listen to Vin Armani. Oh, yeah. And I've started listening to Vin Armani a little bit, too, and I really like the zombie episode. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did you did you listen to the zombie episode? Uh, I listened to – so he's been on this show twice, and uh, I, I did listen uh -huh. to him on Isaac Isaac's show. I listened to him on uh, Clint's show and all the Pete shows. And then uh, – so I don't remember which one – he was talking about that on, but it, it's been the so, kind of the newest thing that he's that the sort of the newest quest that he's on is to is to bring that all together. This was just him, like just him. Oh, just okay. Oh, 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 the the clip that he put out. Yes, 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 mm -hmm. yes. I, yes, I talking did. about how like the zombies are coming, and we need to figure out how to keep them out. And I think so. I listened to some of your stuff too, and um, there's a lot of like like back and forth between mysticism and um, what's the other materialism thing. Yeah. Mysticism and materialism. So um, I think that the zombie thing can be both like in like the, I don't, I, I'm not, I, I'm new at all of this. I, I'm, I mean, I'm not a big like Vin Armani person quite yet. Mm. I've only listened to a few things. So I'm going to use my own lingo and you just tell me what your interpretation is. Yeah, sure. So um, it's like the whole like inside, outside mysticism thing. The zombies can come inside, right? Like they can come inside of you and take you over. And you can be like paralyzed by fear and what's going on in the world and basically succumb to what succumb to feeling what they want you to feel. Um, and also, you know, I think that when he was talking about that, he was talking about it like in the material world as well. Like, 
Mm. I mean, I'm going to be a homesteader. I'm planning to, um, you know, like be completely self-sufficient. So I think that when he said like, figure out how to keep the zombies out, I think that he meant like both in the mystical world and the material world. What are your thoughts? I want to say Genesis three or Genesis six that talks about the sons of God and the daughters of man and the giants that roamed the earth. And uh, Goliath ended up being one of these. It, it's the the name of this particular type of like angel human hybrid is Nephilim. And a lot of the uh, like David Icke videos harken back to this when he talks about lizard people or it, shit that can kind of weird people out. They're like lizard people. What does that mean? But it, it harkens back to Genesis where you're talking about this weird um, sort of influence of angels that came down and mated with human women. And that that's kind of the symbolism that all of that comes from. So I had that context in mind because Vin is undergoing a um, kind of a transformation in the Eastern Orthodox Church right now. So that's where my brain went to first. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it didn't go to the material, but I think you could definitely take it that way. Yeah, I think you could definitely take it that way. For, for me, it's been you know, a balance between the material and the mystical, because I think Vin has said this, and I, I would have agreed with it way before. When you go too far in either direction, you end up in a really bad place. You know, I, mm. I, I don't remember if he used, if you go all the way material, you end up autistic. If you go all the way mystical, you end up schizophrenic. I think that was <laughs> the, uh, the analogy that he used. And I think that's fucking spot on. And, and you can see that with what, you know, organized religions have sort of failed to accomplish over time when you get too many people in there being bureaucratic and kind of screwing the system up. So the, my mind went to Genesis when he was talking about that. But yeah, th there, there's definitely a materialist aspect to it when you're you're dealing with people who are just I mean, if you're watching The Walking Dead and you're just you kind of, you know, maybe you have like three or four drinks and you squint your eyes, don't they kind of look mm -hmm. Like the people you see around you when you when you leave your house these days, they, they kind of do. So I've never seen The Walking Dead. Do you mind if I go grab my Bible? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. All right. All right. I'll be right back. Yep. Okay. Genesis 3. What part? No, it was, uh, it's definitely uh, chapter 6 of Genesis where it says that it came to pass. Man began to multiply on the face of the earth. And that's where he talks about the... Um, the sons of God and the daughters of man. And, and so many of these modern day analogies point to that without, you know, I've never actually talked to Dave. I don't know anything about David Icke, but I know when he talks about lizard people, that's what he's referring to. He's making an allegory mm -hmm. to that. Now he might actually believe that's literally happening. I, you know, I, I don't know, but um, to, to me, it's, it's a story. It's a parable um, to Vin. It might be, somewhere in the middle. I, I don't, I don't want to speak for him, but I, for me, it's a, it's, a, it's an analogy to, you know, people being sort of inhabited by spirits that are not natural for humanity to flourish. Right. So the nef Nephilim. Nephilim. Yep. Nephilim. Those were um, like angels or. Yeah. So the way I understand it, and I, I'm working myself through the Bible for the third time in my life with my friend Chris on this series we've been doing here on the show, and, and he's uh -huh. been kind of kind of helping me through my evolution. But the way I understand it is um, a, a specific type of angels, this is the way the story goes, came down from heaven and they mated with human women f because hmm. they, they were trying to uh, subvert God's love for humans by poisoning the pool, right? Like by poisoning the gene pool. And that was sort of their goal was how can we get in there and mess this up because we're jealous of God's love for human beings. And you can, I guess you can pull out of that whatever you want, but it, it does kind of show when, when human beings hearts are poisoned by things that are not, um, I, I, yeah, I don't want to go too off on a tangent because I, I, I'm not super Christian. I'm, I'm still kind of coming to my own reconciliation with all of this stuff. But you can kind of see when you meet people and, and, and they're, they're lacking a certain meaning and purpose, they will find that meaning and purpose in something that is very, you know, very much not aligned with what would keep humanity flourishing, which is what mm -hmm. we've seen through this, this past year, like this, 
natural biological need for meaning and purpose that I've talked about on the show so much. And because they're, you know, atheists, I suppose, or facts and logic types that even they, they still need this, they still have this biological need for meaning and purpose. So they're finding it in these otherworldly or super material things that if you were to draw back the parable, you could kind of see they're being infiltrated and, and drawn away from quote unquote, mm -hmm. the way. So that would be my interpretation of what he was saying. But I, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I haven't actually talked to him about it. Okay. So what's the way? Ha. Huh. God, I wish I knew. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> it, it, this, um, man, th th this year has, it, it's really awakened me from this lazy slumber of intellect intellectuality that I fell into because I, I was working so hard on establishing my career and owning and operating and managing restaurants. And I, you know, I, I jumped into libertarianism, you know, a little bit before Ron Paul and then kind of just stayed there and, and didn't, mm -hmm. you know, I, I fell into that galaxy brain trap of facts and logic for so long. And e even though, you know, so many things in the libertarian community rubbed me wrong socially, or even like when they would talk about the state and I would say, well, you know what, but Rothbard said this and I'm, I'm just going to stay with that. And then this year happened and I found myself sort of trying to catch up to all of the um, topics and subjects and, and things I should have been listening to or looking at or researching or consuming. Hold, hold on. Hold on. Yeah. I don't believe in should. You don't believe in what? I don't believe in should. In should? <laughs> Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Fair enough. I get that. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. If your path is your path and you, you go forward and you don't go backwards and you don't, you don't think about should. Well, the, you know, I, you're right. That's just me. No, you're, you're right. You're right. You're right. I, I agree with that. And I, I probably misspoke. You're right. Because it's one of those, if you go back in time and kill baby Hitler, maybe you don't even have a civilization today. Like you had to go through that struggle. So I totally get that, that you go through your own personal growth and everything that happens to you, you try to make the best of it and, uh, or you do make the best of it and you learn and yeah. So yes, I, I would, I would agree with your, your interpretation there. So, okay. <laughs> uh, it, but you know, the blue wave, uh, troll bots are going to be mad at you for saying that you wouldn't kill baby Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> the uh the <laughs> as, as thick skinned as i've gotten or as l l let's say i'm um you know on on facebook I i'm probably a little bit more egregious in my opinion stating on twitter uh, i haven't quite found my place there yet I, I don't really know exactly what it is i'm angling for there I, I try to be honest and nice i'm not a good troll um i i tend to post very late at night because of the job that i do and it doesn't mm -hmm. really get into those prime hours. So at some point, right. maybe I end up on like a blue check marks radar, but I, I, I really doubt it will happen. And I, I don't feel like I'm saying anything so egregious that it would even, I don't know, who knows, but maybe. <laughs> uh, maybe people might want something that's like reasonable, that makes sense. Maybe, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm still working through this sort of, you know, getting myself to a point where I, I'm, I'm batting back and forth the idea of like a state versus no state, materialism versus mysticism, you know, law mm -hmm. and order versus freedom. And I feel like if we, you know, God, I hate to use the word we, because you know how anarchists and libertarians are about the word we, but if, you know, human beings in general or like the royal we don't have these internal battles we end up having these material battles that don't really result in anything. And so I feel like my, my end game is to work with people to develop something new or develop a society or work on things in the material world that have a basis in tradition and, and ancient societies, because those, those societies have flourished while it's quite apparent that, the particular society we're living in is fucking fucked, right? So <laughs> there, there, there is something there that, that is worth having a conversation about. I have not drawn too many conclusions about it yet, and I'm not even sure I'm supposed to. I think it's just sort of worth asking the questions and not being 
put into a box where somebody says, well, you're not really being a quote unquote libertarian. Oh, it, who cares? Yeah. Who like, cares? I, I, like, like you're I don't. You're supposed to think. <laughs> yeah. You're supposed to think like that's the whole idea, but not, you know, not in this like Arist Aristilian, geez, I didn't say that word right. Not like Aristotle where you think right. so much you don't accomplish anything, right? right. Like, there should be some sort of like, so I was talking with Matt Erickson on the show and, uh, and I said to him, if I could take Vin Armani and Curtis Yarvin and combine them into some like CERN level large hadron collider, we would either get like the end of the universe that just sinks into a black hole and vanishes into obscurity, or we'd get like the God particle. Like there's something in those two people that Vin Armani and who? Uh, Curtis Yarvin, or um, also known as Mench Menchus Malbug, who wrote Unqualified Reservations. He's been on Pete's show a couple times, and it's kind of okay. kind of made the rounds. But he's um, it's <laughs> the end of the world as we know it. <laughs> he, he's he's definitely a political theorist and somebody who very much lives in the material. But he's looking at you know if if society let me say it this way: if we could create Ancapistan, what would it actually look like? rather than what we just pretend it would look like. And, and how would we get there and, and what would that state look like? And, and kind of combining that with the idea of tradition and culture and law and order, you know, either biblically or historically or anciently, what would that look like? And if we could, you know, focus our direction on actually achieving these things in the real world, you know, maybe we'd actually get somewhere where we're not just saying like, smash the state which to me is completely useless. Like, I don't know what that even means. Right. Right. Because how are we going to do that? We're bound by the non-aggression principle. How are we going to smash anything really? So, so let me ask you that. What are your feelings on the non-aggression principle? What, what do you think? So <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let me word it this way. Um, I think the non-aggression principle is in my opinion, like the golden rule. Don't hurt people. Don't take their stuff. Don't, you know, if you have to defend yourself, defend yourself. And, and that seems to me to be very reasonable. I feel like it is taken to incredibly illogical extremes by many different people with many different viewpoints. And so I'm always curious mm -hmm. what the, you know, the person I'm talking to thinks about it and whether it's limiting or true freedom. So I, I mean, I don't hurt people or take their stuff. Hmm. I like, I personally don't, but, um, okay. So, so here's where I'm really confused mm -hmm. and you and me kind of had like a, like a back and forth, like when we first, um, encountered one another on Twitter uh, and I'll tell you, I, I'll tell you why I'm confused. It's not about the non-aggression principle per se. It's, this is, this is what it is. It's well, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of like anarchists think that a democracy violates the non-aggression principle. Do you agree or disagree as an anarchist? Um, you, you know, it, it depends on this. This is going to sound super equivocating, but it depends on what somebody means by a democracy. If they mean like the American Democratic Republic that encompasses the United States of America, I think, yes, absolutely. If it's you know, my girlfriend and I deciding what to have for dinner, I think there's something incredibly valuable there. So it's, you know, it, it's such a, it's such a vague Are you term. and your girlfriend coming to Pork Fest? Uh, so I, she would very much like to do that. Uh, it's very difficult for me to leave my place of work. Um, first of all, because I'm so incredibly fucking awesome at what I do, but also because totally. it's very difficult to find people. I, that is a hundred percent accurate. <laughs> and, and humility is one of my top hundred best traits, by the way, but right, it's, it's right. also very difficult to find <laughs> help these days, uh, for obvious uh -huh. reasons in this industry, especially. So I, I assume when the unemployment runs out, I might actually be able to hire people. Um, I would love to, I probably won't be able to do it, or maybe I could get up there for like a day. Cause I live in Connecticut. So it's, it's kind of a day drive. Well, it, it's wait, hold on. Pork fest, New Hampshire, right? New Hampshire. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It, it's maybe like three and a half hours from me and we actually have a cabin up there. So it, it's technically doable, but you know, like near there, you have a cabin. 
We have a cabin have a in cabin? a, well, I don't want to say on the, on the air where, where we have it, but it's, it's right on the main New Hampshire border. So it's, it's kind of doable, but the, I think it, it occurs. If I remember talking to Bill Barger on one of the episodes, it's like during my work week, it's like a Wednesday to Sunday or something or a Tuesday to Saturday. Mm-hmm. So it's not any of my days off. So it's hard to pull. I, I would love to do it though. I've never gone to any of those festivals. Okay. So you should just come Adam. Like you're the boss. You're the owner of this place. Just tell the other people that they're going to have to like hold down the fort for four days and just like, just do it. Just cut the cord. Maybe they'll surprise you or maybe it will burn your restaurant down. I don't know. It's no, it, it'll, one it'll, or the other. it'll definitely burn the restaurant down. I'm, I'm actually not the owner of this restaurant, but I it, probably oh. in a position where I could do that if I just said I was going. So I don't know. Well, any, so democratically, I guess you and I are voting on whether or not I'm going to okay, go so, to pork fest. So, okay. So here's my, here's my issue. Okay. Okay. So I hate political parties hmm. and I think that a lot of anarchists also hate political parties because we're like more individualist. Right. Right. Okay. So we have to have a political party because we have zero power if we don't join a political party. So therefore we join the LP and we join the Mises caucus. Correct. Mm. That's a way it could be put. Sure. Okay. So we're in this political party, even though we loathe any kind of like, uh, I, I personally loathe, like, I don't like being told what to do. So therefore I don't tell other people what to do. That's just like my thing in life. And it always has been, even before I figured out what libertarianism was or anarchy or whatever. Like, I just don't, I don't like to lead. I don't like to follow. I just like to be and just let be. So, so we're in this political party because we, all of us who don't like being told what to do, um, we're like teamed up together, right? Because we're like, we don't fucking like being told what to do. Sorry, excuse my French. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's we, not a like, problem. Feel, feel, feel free to let loose with your, yeah. <laughs> okay. We don't, we don't like being told what to do. So we're gonna, um, we, we join the Libertarian Party and we join the Mises Caucus because we don't like being told what to do. So Adam, okay. how do I recruit like, real libertarians like people who live on their homesteads and don't want to be bothered with political bullshit at all ever how do i recruit them into a party that is not democratic why would they want to pay money to be a part of a political party when they're not going to have a say whatsoever i i don't think you should yeah i i okay. I, I, I don't think those are those are not the folks that are worth spending time on. And, and, and to be completely honest, I'm not even sure at this point, as I'm, I'm finding myself becoming more post libertarian, whatever the fuck that means as I, as yeah, I, I do this more, I don't know any of those words. <laughs> I mean, it, it's just, it, I try to be as vague as possible on the show. Cause I, you know, <laughs> I, I bat so many things back and forth in my head, but I, even when somebody says, I don't like being told what to do, I'm not even sure I feel like that's something that we've heard so many times that we we feel like – like obviously everybody feels that way. But there are things that people have said to you or encouraged you to do in your life or given you advice on or even just ordered you to do that make a lot of sense. And and so be, being in business for so long – and I know you, you've obviously run your own stuff and you, you're – I think obviously still are a lawyer whether you're practicing currently or not – that that there are um, – you know, times where if you don't do something a very specific way, you're not, you're going to miss the mark, right? You're not going to hit, you're not going to hit the bullseye. And if somebody were to say, you know, Hey, you should do it this way. And you say, well, I don't like being told what to do. Then you end up failing. So I, I think that that sort of mentality, not that I'm putting this on you or saying you're doing this, but in general, that kind of mentality I think is, is limiting and a little immature, right? That it's of course, Nobody likes being told what to do, but many times being told what to do 
actually pushes us on a path that makes us better humans. So how do, do we interpret that on a, on a grand scale, like outside of our little, you know, social circle of people that we trust and we say, well, I don't want this stranger who I've never met, who was elected to a position I never voted on to tell me what to do. Well, well, no, because I don't know that person. But if it's, you know, a good friend of mine who's like, you know, motherfucker, you should really stop doing that goddamn bullshit and start doing this thing. Otherwise, your life's going to be fucked up. And I say, well, don't tell me what to do. Well, I'm just being like an I'm being an asshole. So <laughs> there, there is something there where, you know, for for society or human beings to flourish, there does need to be a little bit of give to that statement. So, you know, if somebody wants you know, to. I I'm kind of immature. <laughs> no, I, 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 don't, I don't think you are. I don't think you are at all. No, I kind of, no, I kind of am. I'm kind of like, okay, my worst and my best trait is that I am not a good follower. Mm. Mm. So, so yeah, I mean, I, and I don't really follow people that I'm supposed to follow. Like I'm the type of person who, like I choose my leaders and they're very rare. Like if I, if I choose a leader to, to follow, it's, um, it's very rare. Mm -hmm. Well, th well there, are, there are probably people, though, that you have, you know, researched or that are mentors to you that you might not consider to be a leader, but somebody who's, you know, helped guide you along a path or, you know, helped you see something a different way that you, you didn't you couldn't view before and somebody that yeah. you might, you know, might have a lot of like personal respect for for doing that. You know, I, I definitely wouldn't... like there's a lot of people that I have a lot of respect for and I'll like take everything in that they say and then kind of like mm -hmm. figure out like whether or not I want to mm -hmm. yep. comply. I, and, and that seems to me to be the way that I think most people operate. Yet w when you're, you know, again, the royal you, when you're in this uh, Twitter, Twitter, Twitter sphere. Or, oh. you know, social, even when you're just in a group setting, it, it can be mm -hmm. very, it, it's such a, it's such a touchy subject because like the way I just presented that to you or the way that we're having this conversation seems very reasonable and rational. I hope to people who are listening yet right after this, we'll go on Twitter and we'll see people being like, I don't, I own me and I don't listen to shit. And you're like, that's not true. Of course that's not true. There's no way you, you can possibly live your life that way. You, you would be shunned by everybody around you. And clearly you must have at least some friends. So if, if you know. I mean, I listen. I listen. I always listen. I just don't always follow directions. Hmm. That's all. Well, I mean, that that's a way. I mean, in, in, in that way, you find your way, right? Like it, it might be your, your practice of working through things on your own. And that gets you to a better place because you can. You can make mistakes or, you know, the, the definition of sin is to just miss the mark. That's what it like literally translates to. So it's, you know, if you miss the mark, you, you learn how to shoot better. And, and that might be your way to, to get to a better place for you. And I, I think that's mm -hmm. fine. You know, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't want anyone to, you know, blindly follow somebody into a gulag because they're, they feel like they need, they need a leader, but it's, it's certainly fine to be mentored by or, or, or get information shared by somebody that you respect. And I, I feel like any, anytime I would have this conversation with somebody, they would understand that. But then so many people go right back to the Twitter sphere and they're, and they, they say the exact fucking opposite again. And it just seems well, to me to be really bad the marketing. People, the people that they like respect are in this Twitter sphere, which is maybe. Yeah. 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 Maybe. And, and they're, and they're, they're afraid they're going to get blocked or, uh, you know, someone's going to come down on them and say something. So I, I'll give you a, I'll get, fuck, I'll give you an example today that was super embarrassing. So there's, um, there's these, uh, bell curve IQ charts that have come out in meme form where it's like, you have a low IQ on the left side, high IQ on the right side, and then the bell curve going through the middle and the left side and the right side both agree on the premise, but the one in the middle is doing a whole bunch of like equivocating and mathematics and trying to be logical and rational. And uh -huh. I, you, you maybe have seen them or whatever. And I, I think Vin or somebody had, had tweeted it 
and I was staring at it and I'm like, I don't know what this thing is called. I can't for the life of me think what this chart is called. And I didn't know how to Google it because I didn't know how to explain it. So I just said, what is this thing called without the meme? And Vin wrote back, it's called a bell curve. And I was like, motherfucker. <laughs> It, you know, <laughs> of, of course it is. I'm like, I'm retiring from Twitter tonight. I'm a total dipshit. I'm very sorry. Uh, everybody take care. And, you know. I don't it, even <laughs> think that makes you, like, dumb in any way. Like, I'm not good with words. I'm good with concepts and ideas, but I'm really not good with words and labels and stuff. Well, well to your point, I, I feel like, it, you know, a lot of folks can get on social media and, and they, they're, they're so nervous about, you know, losing a like or uh, having somebody that they respect block them or say something t to them that disagrees. And, and it, it just shows Isn't to me. Isn't that like the problem with people and society mm -hmm. though? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's also a matter of like social acceptance. Like pe people in society want to be liked. You know, you want to be mm -hmm. accepted by your social circle. And when you really have like a, a, a good amount of admiration for somebody that you, you feel has mentored you or helped you or helped you to see things intellectually or spiritually or whatever, you, you don't want to say something that's going to make that person, you know, flip you off. Then, But then again, the onus is on that person to use their intellect and spirituality and ability to communicate to not read into it so much where they're just like, fuck you, block Right. And then, right. And then, so when you have this space where people can't see each other and they, they're not face to face and they can't communicate in a, in a superhuman way, you have a lot of that, you have a lot of that transpiring at all times. And it's, mm -hmm. it, I, I think it can be incredibly emotional, rec emotionally wrecking for people. And uh, for me, it's like, I don't really care. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know, maybe I will at some point, but, but, I, but I could totally see how it would be devastating for a lot of people. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I've had a bad day. Like I've got a lot of trolls after me right now. <laughs> Let's talk about that. And I almost cried, but then I decided to work on my flooring <laughs> instead. Well, so, well, we, we barely talked about you, which is what I really wanted to do. So well, well let's, you know, we'll, well obviously <laughs> if, if you're cool with it, I want to keep a lot of that in there. Cause that was an, an incredible, uh, bunch of stuff that we talked about, but, um, I probably should have you talk about you a little bit and uh, how you came up, uh, what you do for a living and how you got into this quote unquote liberty space. Oh goodness. Hmm. I mean, you do can say it however you want. Do we have to talk about me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have to talk about you. We have to. <laughs> a little bit. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So, so what do you want to know? You want to know like, uh, like how I became a libertarian? I mean, I mean, really, really what, one of the things I, I thought we, we would talk about would be the, um, the Chauvin trial and, um, and George Floyd. But honestly, I'm really, really liking the direction you chose to go with this <laughs> more than that, just because it's, it's more in my wheelhouse and I didn't really know shit about that other thing. So <laughs> feel free so to just kind of go on with whatever you want to go on about I, I really, whatever, you know, I'm open to whatever. So I'll just talk real quick about yeah. Chauvin. Just, I'll just real quick do that. I did not think that that trial would even, I think it was all a show. Yeah. I really think that it was a show um, because I saw the autopsy. Like I, I look at, uh, I look at stuff on scribd.com because mm -hmm. I don't have access to like any legal search engines, legal search engines right now. I just have scribd and, um, and that's easier than like going on court dockets and stuff. Right. And so I, I went on Scribd and I got the autopsy and then I showed it to my friend who's a scientist and I like showed different parts of it. And um, like George Floyd had a lot of fentanyl in his system. A lot, a lot, lot. And it was like over the lethal limit of fentanyl. So like if I had that case as a defense attorney and like you always wait until you get the autopsy before you go to trial. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if I had been in that situation, like as the defense attorney and then, you know, waiting on the autopsy and then you get the autopsy and then like, if I had seen it and then um, 
the prosecutor wanted to take the case to trial, I probably would have laughed in his face. Mm. Um, yeah. And I talked to, actually, I talked to my former, I, I still talk to my former opponent sometimes on Facebook. And I was like, what do you think about this? And he was like, eh, third degree or like manslaughter or whatever. And I was like, eh, yeah, like we probably would have, um, like with that autopsy, there would not have been a murder trial because you can't, because every element of the crime has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. And causation of death is a very important element, which cannot be proven beyond a reasonable doubt because of the amount of fentanyl that was in Floyd's system. So that's what I think, like as, as a former defense attorney. You know, the, the thing about the whole George Floyd situation that I keep bouncing around in my head is that it, pretty much any, any stance you can take, liberal, conservative, libertarian, whatever, you can kind of find nuggets of, of your own truth in there that highlight, highlight your belief system. Right, that there's mm -hmm. there's so many moving pieces going on in that situation from the start of George Floyd first being approached by the police to uh, the end of the trial and Chauvin mm -hmm. being sentenced. There's so many moving pieces. When you look at, you know, you could take the stance that, you know, ACAB, right? All cops are bad. You could take the stance that he was breaking a law. You could take the stance that that law was stupid. He never should have been approached. You could take the stance mm -hmm. that, you know, he was already subdued or you could take the stance that he was all fucking fucked up and nobody knew what he was going to do. There's so many ways you could look at it. And the legal system, of course, is going to have to pick one of those things. And I'm totally open to the idea that this was a sacrificial lamb situation. And it, it very well might be that lacking that context, this would have turned out the same way, right? It, that it didn't necessarily have to go the other direction with an acquittal. But I, I do think there is a lot of social pressure and fear on the people, the jurors and the judge to, to do what they did. And that's not even me saying that I do or don't agree with the verdict. I just don't there trust was it. A lot of social pressure on those jurors. Definitely. You would have I to would think. have been very afraid if I had been a juror in that case, I would have been very afraid to acquit. And, and then, definitely. and then you definitely have to think too about, you know, when somebody says they want a society without police officers, well, okay. I mean, Michael Malice has taken this point too. And I, I, I vehemently disagree with him on it. Yes. The particular type of police officer we have here in the United States of America in 2021 is not certainly the ideal, but in, he would be the first person to advocate for private defense. So it's like, okay, you're, you're going to have some human being enforcing something that people in society agree should be enforced, right? So like at what point, where have we gotten where this is so absurd that I could find like 15 different arguments that all make sense to me in the same situation? And my only rational conclusion to this is this shit has got to be completely destroyed. Like this entire system is so fucking washed out and it's like a tie dyed shirt. Like it makes no sense. And the only way to do it is just let it obliterate itself and to try to create something new that makes sense. Cause none of, none of this, it, it's a, it's a microcosm of our civilization that this particular incident and trial that none of this just makes any fucking sense. Right. You can okay, just interpret so it however I the think, fuck you want. So, so I think that's the media. Like it doesn't make any fucking sense because the media hypes up some stuff that shouldn't be hyped up in order to sow division between races, right? But, so I don't think that all cops are bad. I don't think that we should get rid of police departments. And if we had private security, so like personally, like for me, I could afford to hire my own private security force, but, and I would be safe, right? But other people wouldn't be safe. And so that's not really good either. If there are like innocent people who are being harmed because I mean, let's not forget that there are women and children who are being raped 
and murdered Mm -hmm. every day Mm -hmm. all around this country. And um, for the most part, most police officers do a pretty good job of um, catching the culprits or the accused or whatever. I do want to say, however, I really think that Rodney Reed is innocent. I'll just throw that in there. Um, You know, something that I do think does matter that people should Mm. pay attention to. Okay. So, um, so having practiced like as a public defender, I will say that there are definitely like five fucking shitty cops in the County where I practiced who know where that gray area is in like constitutional law. And they just like surf that gray area Mm -hmm. all the fucking time. And it really pisses me off. And then there are like, I don't know, like, I don't even know how many like other cops in the County that are pretty awesome. And some of them are kind of not, educated on the law. I'll say that because, you know, like there was one time that um, I filed a motion to suppress because a cop continued questioning my client after my client had invoked his um, right to remain silent and the cop still kept questioning. And so I filed the motion and then the cop came in for the suppression hearing and we didn't even have the suppression hearing. Like the judge reamed that cop like reamed his ass, like, you do not do that. And and he said that, like, well, this is just our new policy. And he's like, the policy stops. (laughs) Tell them, you understand? (laughs) And so, like, there's stuff like that. Um, So, like, some judges are good, you know. Some cops are are good and some cops are um, stupid. And some cops are just, like, trying to get a paycheck, just, Mm -hmm. like, doing following policy or whatever, you know? And I kind of felt bad for that guy because he, he really was just like following policy. And so like, I I followed him out of the courtroom that day and I was like, listen, you know, sorry, I have to do my job. And he was like, I understand whatever. So it's like a, like I have to do my job. Like I have to, I can't let that shit go. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Ever, you know, like ever, ever, ever. If there's some kind of constitutional violation, then I file that motion to suppress and I battle that shit all the way. But at the same time, you know, like it's not really personal. Okay, sometimes it's kind of personal because sometimes it's like people that I really don't like. (laughs) So it feels personal, even if I don't like allow it to look like it's personal. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. But I don't think that all cops are bad. And I, I do think that what I think is that the intelligence agencies are, I think we need to get rid of the intelligence agencies because they are allowed to operate in the darkness and basically like not show the people what they're doing well well thankfully all we have to do is elect dave smith because he's spitting that hot liberty fire shit and he's going to abolish the cia if he gets elected president so there you go (laughs) just like that poof the entire military industrial complex will vanish when a uh, podcasting libertarian (laughs) becomes elected (laughs) yeah i mean the words of (laughs) pete quinones fucking poof (laughs) (laughs) yeah fucking poof yeah, just gone. It's gone. That's it. No more. No more CIA. It's just yeah. There's no. Gonna, that's fine. They're Good. Be, get rid of them. But uh, in, get in, rid in, of the in, FBI in, too. In, in in theory, yes, that's a that's a, a very admirable goal. I, I think they might put up a little bit of a fight, but I think in theory, it's it's certainly an admirable goal. Yes. So okay, so I have one more thing to say about like yeah, go cop ahead. stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay, so criminal justice reform. It's a good idea. The most important part of criminal justice reform is mandatory body cams for all cops always. Mm -hmm. And I don't really figured out like the bathroom situation yet because (laughs) technically they could all like go into the bathroom and talk to each other. And, you know, they're already talking to each other like on their cell phones instead of on the radio. And I have a huge problem with that. Okay. So, but but that's not my point. My point is that we had two criminal justice reform acts, right? We had the justice act, 
proposed by the Republican Party and the Justice and Policing Act proposed by the Democratic Party. Okay. Neither one of those acts. Okay, so they were almost identical, almost identical. The Republicans Justice Act did not ban chokeholds and the Republicans Justice Act did not include like Justin Amash's and qualified immunity thing. Mm-hmm. Other than those two things, they were pretty much identical. And I read both of them and I thought, you know what, motherfuckers? <laughs> body cam videos, like body cams on cops should be mandatory now. Not in three years. They should be mandatory now. I am fucking sick of getting like body cam videos from prosecutors and 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 Sometimes they don't even turn them over. And then I have to say to the judge, you know, I'm sorry, I'm waiting for this because I need to see if I could possibly file a motion to suppress. And the prosecutor has not turned over, you know, X body cam video. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't the the police want? I mean, I I would think I would want the evidence if if I'm doing everything the way I think I'm supposed to be doing it. Not if they're violating the Fourth Amendment to the point. Well, obviously to where they're doing something I could wrong. Get the case yeah. dismissed. Right, but it, but if, if they think they're doing it right, the case. like in drug cases, mm. these these drug cops are a problem, mm. and uh, a lot of the time they either said that their jacket was covering the lens, covering the camera lens, right? So I only got audio and not video. Or I just, or they just said that they didn't have it. And so what do you do when you have a client who's like, um, I wasn't fucking doing anything. And I don't even like, why did they stop me? You know, like you don't know, really, you can't tell if you don't have the body cam video, whether or not they were detained, whether or not they actually were free to leave, Mm -hmm. you know, because if it's, if it's um, not a valid detention and they're saying, you know, like if, if the cops don't have probable cause to hold them, to detain them, and they're saying like, I want to get the fuck out of here. And the cops are like holding them anyways. That's like bad news bears, right? For the cops. That's like dismissal. And so, yeah, like when you're not getting these videos or when like you get the videos, but the cop writes in the police report that like his jacket fell over the camera lens, that is fucking bullshit. Hmm. And so I can't <laughs> do my job to uphold the constitution by like filing these motions to suppress if they don't fucking turn that shit over and it pisses me off. And so both of these acts, the Republicans justice act and the Democrats justice in policing act, they're both bullshit. Number one, Republicans wouldn't talk to Democrats and Democrats would not talk to Republicans. They never wanted to pass any kind of criminal justice reform legislation in the first place. Right. Yep. And number right. two, even if they had passed either one of those for like mandatory body cam videos to be enforceable three years from now, instead of like three months from now is bullshit. Hmm. So I, I'm sorry. I just got angry. Uh, no, that, that's angry. great. Uh, I mean, it's uh it's an, it's an interesting, <laughs> it's an interesting subject. I, I would, you know, it, it's, the, the body cam thing is, is obviously something when we're living in this particular state of governance, uh, I, I would say it, it's kind of a no brainer uh, when it came to, you know, even, right, right. This is, this is obviously the reality that we're living in. So I, I would we think have it's to uh, be in the reality. Yeah, that we're yeah in, no, right? I, I'm like, totally with you. Yeah. There's yeah. no other reality. <laughs> yep. Nope. A hundred percent correct. And you know, I, I don't know how many people we've, we have probably pissed off everybody so far <laughs> through this episode, which is fucking awesome. Uh, no, I would I, every fucking day. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would agree. I think that's you know, and and again, I'll I'll go back to it. You know, there is no argument for the police against the body camera because if you're a believer that what you're doing is is morally correct and that you're actually protecting and serving the public that pays you, you would at least I would I would want the proof that I'm doing the right thing. I would I gladly, like every restaurant I've operated, every bar, I put cameras in. And I always tell people, I put them in to show that I'm always in the right. That's it. That's the whole, the whole reason they're there 
is to prove to anybody who tried to tell me I fucking did something wrong that I did exactly the right thing. And good, that's how they should look you. at it, you know, but that's how they should look yeah, at it, right? Exactly. So, uh, yeah, I, I can't see an argument against it. You would think that you want it there. And if you don't want it there, what does that say about you, right? Right. And yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I, I'm not, I have, I have in the past during some, you know, l- lapses in judgment, use the all cops are bad argument. I, I know I've done it. I don't know if I've done it on the show. And, and certainly it would be in the context of, they're enforcing uh, obviously everything by mandate that legislature decrees should be enforced. And even then, even looking back on those kind of quote unquote arguments that I've made, even in like Ancapistan, if somebody's going 130 miles on the highway, we, or, or, you know, whatever fake roads are in Ancapistan and they're weaving in and out of traffic, it, it's kind of like, dude, can somebody stop them from doing that? Like, I know they're not technically hurting anyone yet, but I mean, do I have to wait to get shot when someone's pointing a gun in my face? Like at some point, libertarians and anarchists are going to have to realize that even in a free society, you can't have fucking assholes just doing whatever the fuck they want. And you say, well, they haven't technically aggressed on me yet. You're like, well, yeah, they haven't technically, but like, this is like you said, the real world. And they're going 130 miles an hour hammered, weaving in and out of traffic, and they might fucking kill your family if the wheel turns a quarter inch in the wrong direction. Like, at what point, like, do you get out of your fucking mindset of, you know, this literal materialist fucking Rothbard and say, that's not going to be acceptable. But then again, do you want someone to be pulled over, beaten and shot because they rolled through a stop sign? This is my struggle. This is where I'm trying to figure out some sort of middle ground here between people. And I don't know if that's, I I do think it's possible, but it's definitely worth having the conversation because no one's really doing that. Right. Yeah. I don't, I don't know either. You know, I think those are all really good points and I think that people should think about that. And I don't know, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't, um, I guess, you know, like, I don't think all cops are bad, Mm. but as far as that situation in particular, like, um, you know, someone driving 130 miles per hour down the road, drunk and stoned, like they should not be allowed to do that. You know, what's so funny. Okay. This is kind of analogous. I think it's analogous. I really do because my brain connected it. So maybe it's analogous. I'm not sure. Yeah, go for it. But um, Angela Angela McArdle was just in Nevada, right? Mm -hmm. She Mm -hmm. might still be there. I'm not sure. But there's like bullshit going on in Nevada. Very interesting stuff. Yes. Yeah. So I tried to kind of like figure all of it out. And then I was like, this is just like a hot mess. Like, I don't even know. Like, I have no idea. I really kind of don't care. Like, I mean, I do care if someone was embezzling money and spending it on hookers and booze, but like, it's like a story that I've heard over and over again. So it's, it's like, this is a political party people. Like, what do you fucking think is going to happen? It's a political party. So yeah, like I'm not surprised. If someone was embezzling money and spending it on hookers and boots, I think that movie with Leonardo DiCaprio, where he's like the, anyway, sorry. Um, anyway, back to the point, which was, I just, I kind of like joked to her, like, um, seems like LP Nevada needs to be governed. Mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a great line. I like that line. I like that line. Right. Yeah. Because like, obviously they can't handle this on their own. So maybe they need a government, like maybe they need someone to write rules like a legislature. Right. And maybe they need like some kind of um, enforcement, you know, like a judiciary. <laughs> well, maybe they-, they need a leader, like an executive branch, you know? And so you can't fucking get away from, government like if it's not this government it's going to be another government right Mm, even in in Pakistan yes because in in Pakistan there's always going to be an idiot who's yes embezzling money or who's 
driving down the road 130 miles per hour, drunk and high. So I don't think that there's any way to get away from government. So what's so like what's worse is is this government worse, which this government is really fucking bad, like especially the DNC. Um, that's my thing. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm but, I'm of the position that this government is over. I mean, I, I've already taken that position. This, as far as I can see from just uh, history and cycles and patterns, we, we are currently living in what would be called by anybody 100 years from now a failed state. That That's just right. what I think about it. And, and that doesn't it's, mean it's, that the ideas that the founders of this country in their right-wing coup to you know establish the Constitution uh, didn't have like the right ideas in mind. But clearly, we are not living in a world where those ideas are actuated in reality. And so I see this as a failed state. But to your point that there would be some sort of, quote unquote, government in any situation is, to me, it's Misesian. It's, ve- it's very economic. It's division of labor. Wait, wait. Say that it's m- 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 what, oh, what? Uh, like Lu- Ludwig von Mises. It's very Misesian, like the, in the economic. Oh, Misesian. Okay. Right. In that it's a, a division of labor. It's that I don't Mm -hmm. want to worry about how to control people driving on the roads. And so clearly I would want someone else to do that the same way I would want someone else to create ice cream so that I didn't have to do it. So I could go to the ice cream parlor and buy the ice cream, right? So even in Ankapistan, you would have people, I would imagine, because even though Ancap say they want to govern themselves, nobody really wants to do that because it's fucking time consuming. You would want to outsource through division of labor to somebody who was very good at doing that specific thing that needed governance, whether it was building the roads or building the new superhighway or the flying cars or whatever the fuck in Kapistan would develop because it's so free market oriented or whatever fucking bullshit. So yes, th- there would obviously be, you know, some mm-hmm. sort of rules. And and I just having read Hoppe and even Yarvin, it's I think there would be a lot more of them. I think in Kapistan would be so closed bordered. There, there'd be like three moats and seven walls before you get the fuck in there. And if you violate this fucking don't hurt people and take their stuff shit, they're hucking you with a catapult over the wall and the moats. Like that, that's just what right. I think it would look like. And uh, I've yet to talk to say that to anybody who can present any counter argument to it. So yes, I, I do think government will exist regardless, even if it's just a consensus of the people in an area. But that to me sort of feels like the way, right? Like, because most land on the planet is either already occupied or homesteaded or seasteaded, and it would be very difficult, time consuming and expensive to homestead or seastead a a large enough body of land to create a society that some sort of like mass secession or, you know, mass pull down to the local level where you could kind of take over your town and sort of fortify it against outside influence where it wouldn't matter to me what you, what you looked like, who you loved, who you wanted to fuck, what religion you had, as long as we are like ideologically aligned on the ideas of individual liberty and economic freedom, you are allowed in there. And if you were antithetical to that, you're fucking not allowed in there. And that to me seems like but that gets us tell? to a point. How do you tell? Like you can't I don't know. tell what's in someone's mind. Yeah, I, at least I, not yet. Yeah, I don't I I don't know. I, I don't know. Which I, freaks me out. Mm-hmm, because yep. then you get to like the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab and the uh fourth industrial revolution. And have you looked at that book? Because it's oh, yeah. kind of scary. Well, you could also get the other way too. And 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 Yarvin, who's a I, I would call like my my favorite right winger, has said if you get to fascism, you did it wrong. And I'm a big believer in that. So you could get to the point where you have somebody be like, I'm going to tell you what Ancapistan is and the rules and, you know, start booting people out who are not violating them. Yeah, I'm totally open to that. I totally understand that that's an option that would probably happen. So I Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly, but I think at least broaching the conversation and at least throwing the ideas out there is a starting point for people to start, I guess, thinking on a tertiary level above these like Twitter talking points of, you know, don't hurt people, take their stuff is great. Or, you know, we should all live in a free society is great. Or, you know, I don't want anyone to tell me what to do is great. 
but let's jump up a couple of levels and think about how this actually works in the real world because yes please for the love of god right because as long as we're having that conversation this reality is currently beating us to fucking death so Mm -hmm. (laughs) unless we're going to die on the sword of twitter arguments with each other maybe there's a way to figure out what the next move is here to create something new (laughs) i don't know if that makes sense i hope it makes sense i love it yeah Unless we're going to die on the sword of Twitter arguments with each other. Yeah. I mean, seriously, man. <laughs> it's like, let's have like actual conversations yeah. about this. Like, what would Ancapistan look like? Has anyone thought about it? Like, a few people have. Well, let's do that. Right. You know, let's do that. Let's think about it. Yeah. Let's get out of daycare. And and I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty involved here in the Mises Caucus in Connecticut. Uh, I'm not political. Mm-hmm. I don't involve myself in the political part, but I am, I am friendly with these guys. We we do talk often. I do voice my mm-hmm. opinion a lot. I, I'm very proud of them. I think especially within all of the Mises caucus groups, state and local and county in the country, I think we're definitely right up there. And I'm Yeah, very, you guys have a good – I like Connecticut's thank you. Mises. I think you're doing great. And, and I'm, I'm very um, – you know, e- even though I will push back on on Dave Smith quite a bit, although I don't think he pays any attention to me, I I, I do like what he's doing. He should. I, I I do think what he's doing is is going to achieve something, and I do think Mises Caucus will take over the Libertarian Party, which is really not that difficult to do. They're going to do it in a landslide. It's going to be very interesting to see what they do when they have the power that they will eventually have. That to me is like one of the most fascinating social experiments I could possibly imagine. And it's going to, it's going to show a lot. It's going to show a lot of us what these ideas will translate to. If you actually had the opportunity for a little bit of power. And I, I think the Mises caucus in general, especially the leadership, Michael, Dave, Tom, these guys are not morons and they're hard workers. They're very intelligent. They're very kind human beings, very empathetic human beings. And they're great uh, with communicating the message I think when they get the thing that they want, which they will, it's going to be fascinating to see what they do with it and how the response comes from the cathedral to them and what they do with that. I'm, mm-hmm. I, I'm excited is the wrong word, but uh, absolutely ready to be fascinated by the results of this. I think it's going to be incredible one way or the other. I do too. And I just want to add like a few things. Mm-hmm. So you said Tom, Dave, I don't know who else you said. Uh, Mike, Michael Heiss. Yes, Heiss. Love him. Mm-hmm. Love him. Uh, Angela, great. Angela, definitely. Um, Dave, Heiss. Yeah, Angela, Pete, mm-hmm. Scott. And, you know, like Dave Smith, like I support Dave Smith. I think Dave Smith is, is pretty fucking cool. And I also support like Thomas Massey. If Thomas Massey were to decide to run as – a Republican, like in the Republican primary in 2024, I think that that would be, even though he's a Republican, like that would be like right along the objective that we are hoping to achieve. I think that Thomas Massey could get there. Um, But, you know, also like, I think everybody is like, oh, Dave Smith, Dave Smith. Like we're all like fanboys and fangirls of Dave Smith. And I think Dave Smith is really cool, but Dave Smith himself even said like, it's not going to happen unless we get Angela McArdle Mm -hmm. as like um, chair, like chair of the LP. We need her. And earlier I said to you, like, I don't really thought like I choose my leaders, right? I, I really, I I don't really lead, I don't really follow just anyone, but I have chosen to follow Angela McArdle. And I think that she is a very strong leader. And I think that she does have what it takes to fix all of these petty, stupid problems that are in the LP. Um, Because she behaves like an adult and I, I don't doubt that she went into Nevada, was it Nevada? Mm-hmm. I don't doubt that she went into Nevada today and fucking cleaned house. I don't know if it was today or yesterday. I don't doubt that she like handled that shit. 
Well, Nevada definitely had a, the success that many of us would have wanted them to have. They definitely did. Okay, yeah. good. And I'm glad. And I'm glad that she was there to handle it. And I, like, she's a leader to me. Like, I choose her. I choose my leaders. I choose Angela McArdle. Mm -hmm. And I think that, like, if we do want the Mises Caucus to have any kind of power or influence in the future over the Libertarian Party, which I do, um, I think that we can't, can't forget that we need Angela as the chair of the LP. Like, we can't just go straight to, like, ah, President 2024. Right. Because there's a whole lot of time between now and then. And so what are we going to do? Are we just going to like be cheerleaders for the next three years? Because I was a cheerleader in high school and I don't really feel like cheerleading, <laughs> to be honest. Hmm. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I think you're I think you're 100 percent on point. I, I can't remember if it was Buck that I was talking to about this, but I, I've said it multiple times. So I'll, I'll just reiterate it here. I think Angela is j just from a, a marketing and messaging background that I have like a, a mm -hmm. having run my side business messaging and marketing for restaurants and bars uh, and in kind of understanding social media presence and not me personally which I'm terrible at it but <laughs> for helping other people through their their businesses there's something you about You just don't have enough haters. I, I just don't I don't care enough to focus on myself like when people pay me I spend a lot of time helping them and I care about what they're doing but there's something yeah. about Angela that is to me that I've never seen her, and she's been on the show, and I, I asked her these questions. I asked her very pointed questions that I thought she answered very, very well. This was back mm -hmm. last year. And I've watched her very closely since then as I lurk around the Twitter sphere. She doesn't make mistakes. It, whether she's speaking genuinely in those social media conversations or whether it's practiced or whether it's just bullshit – that I I see every single one of them and I'm like that's fucking on point that's fucking on point and that's fucking on point she keeps getting better yep yep yeah yes she keeps yes. getting better and and that is a that is a trait that I don't I don't see anyone else involved in the libertarian party not one single human being including Dave or any I don't see anybody else with that kind of track record of social media marketing and messaging skills I don't know if I've ever seen anyone and, and maybe I would put Jason Stapleton in that category, but sometimes he even sounds like he's just reading off a card. There's something mm -hmm. very genuine about her and something very consistently awesome about what she does in a messaging sense that yeah. you, 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 you're just – you're drawn to her. And to me, it doesn't yeah. matter if it's bullshit or honest. It fucking works. But I don't – it's not bullshit. Yeah, I don't think it is either. I don't think it's it is It's not either. bullshit. Like I, um, I was a Tulsi Gabbard supporter. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I was asked to be a delegate like at the DNC convention. And I said no, because I couldn't like sign at the bottom of that page pledging to be loyal to the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. And so I donated the max to Tulsi's campaign, like two thousand seven hundred dollars went to Tulsi's campaign, but they never controlled me. They like. A couple of times, like, you know, like campaign people would be like, oh, don't say that. And I'd be like, fuck you. I don't work for you. You know, like that kind of thing, because I'm kind of an immature type of person who doesn't do well with leadership. What, and what was it? What was it about her that attracted you to her so much? Um, I really thought that she had what it took to be Donald Trump. And I thought, I mean, honestly, she's, she's super talented. Like, I, I think you're right, by the way. I, I do think she had what it, what it took to beat Donald Trump. She didn't have what it took to beat her own party. No, she did have what it took to beat her own party, but her own party is corrupt as shit. Right. Yes. That's, that's like, that, that's what I, I mean, you said what I said much better than I said it poorly. Yes. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Like I promise you the DNC, the DNC, the DNC is just like fucking corrupt as shit. Like from top to bottom, from bottom to top, it's just fucking, it's just like a big piece of shit. Um, so Tulsi, Tulsi, and I, I, I knew, I knew like I, when I saw Tulsi on that debate stage, like I wasn't even like, I didn't even really want to watch. And then I was watching and then I was like, um, oh, holy fucking shit. Like who is this woman? Like, 
she has what it takes to defeat Donald Trump. Like, wow. And so I immediately donated like a hundred bucks. And then I spent like the next, like, I was like, wow, I'm so impressed with her talent, right? That I donated a hundred bucks. And then I spent like six full weeks, um, like researching every single thing. And like, by the end of those six weeks, I knew that she would not win. I understood the, like uh, most of the extent of the DNC corruption, you know, like I knew about the DNC fraud lawsuit and I knew about, um, you know, like Saudi Arabia or like Saudi Arabian lobbyists giving money to the Podesta group and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I knew about all of it, like by the end of that six weeks, because I was just like obsessively researching and, um, and I, I donated like the other $2,600 anyways, because I wanted her message to get out like her anti-war mm -hmm. yeah. message. And um, I, I disagree with her on a lot of things. And, uh, you know, I still love her. I, I've been talking to um, Reed Coverdale, who just, just landed on my radar, probably because I'm not that consumed with the Libertarian Party nationally. And I right. listen to him on – He's such a good guy. He, he does certainly seem like that. And I, I reached out to him on, on Twitter. I didn't have an email, so I just – I sent him an in, a, a message and to see if he would want to come on. He doesn't know who I am, obviously. And uh, he was a little – it seemed a little bit off-put by the, the way that I approached it, which is whatever. Some, some people like it. Some people don't. But what I liked about him as I've learned about him the past couple of months, he would have been in that same camp. I think he said he, he worked on – her campaign on Tulsi's campaign. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's, you know, the, I was curious to talk to him about the evolution between then and now and what brings you from one place to the other. So it's very interesting, the parallel, you bringing that same thing up because th there is something about her that, you know, it, it's not just the anti-war message because obviously that resonates with all of us in the Liberty space, but there's something about Tulsi Cabard that, that is, is not just genuine, but it, it feels like she comes at it from a place where she's like, I fucking live this and you really need to listen to me. So Tulsi Gabbard, um, I, I didn't know if she was genuine or not. Mm. This is what I was going to say. I didn't really know. OK, like game recognizes game. T Tulsi has fucking mad talent, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. She has talent on the debate stage. She has talent. She she's very, very talented in what she does. And, you know, I do think that she was genuine. Sometimes I think that she's not as genuine as she is other times. Mm, OK. For example, like she's a member of the World Economic Forum. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. Um how, how does one become a member of that? Do you like pay like a five dollar dues fee, or how do you how do you do that? So in maybe I should maybe I should infiltrate it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, kick John Podesta out. <laughs> yeah, at any time. Um, I don't really know. Hmm. I don't really know. I know that she interesting was uh, like her membership began in 2016. I know that. And I have asked her about it twice and she has not responded. And I don't like expect her to treat me special just because I'm like a donor. You know, she doesn't have to respond when I ask her questions. That's fine. But I mean, I did do like an episode on it with David Spuria, who was another like former Tulsi supporter. And, mm. you know, like I, when I, when I first threw my support behind her, it's because I was like, holy fucking shit. This woman is so talented. And like, as a, as a lawyer and like someone who has experience, like arguing with people a lot, you know, I saw the talent, like immediately I saw, I was like, holy shit, like she has what it takes to defeat Donald Trump. This is who I like. And then I discovered, you know, like all of the DNC corruption hmm. bullshit. But okay, so here's my contrast, right? 
Angela McArdle, I don't think that she is like, I think that she's genuine. Yeah. I don't, I don't see that she's like all that talented. I think like she gets better and better and better mm-hmm. every fucking time yep. she gives a speech. Yep. Right. Yep. And she wants to make a difference, yep. but I don't see that like, um, and to me, it's a good thing. Like, yep. I don't see that. Like, oh, I like I was born for the camera type no, you're thing. Right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You know, and, and I and I really fucking like that because I mm-hmm. like people who are genuine and real. Mm-hmm. And sometimes like when I listen to and I like Dave Smith, too, like I like him a lot. But some like some of his recent um, speeches, like I know that they're rehearsed. I know that they're. Like somebody wrote them and, um, and that's fine. Like you can give a speech and you can rehearse it. And, and Angela, I'm sure Angela practices her speeches too. Like every good speaker practices what they're going to say. But when I listen to Angela, I feel like she's talking to all of us. And I feel like she's like, like, it's not just talent. Like, it's really coming from, like, something deeper. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, I totally agree. The, the, there's something that you're, that certain people are just born with that they hone over time. And, mm-hmm. you know, and, and they're, they're just, you have to have this thick skin and be resilient enough to not let, and, and I'm, you know, listen, I'm just as guilty of this as anybody, especially doing what I do for a living where I'm dealing with drunk, like a hundred drunk people every night, five nights a week where there are, there are certain nights where I'm just like, fuck you, get the fuck out of here. I'm going to fuck you up. And I haven't seen her and it could be, she just really understands messaging so much that she takes a deep breath before she tweets anything or says anything. And that's great. Mm -hmm. That in itself is a fucking talent that I don't possess. So, just being in the moment, even when she's been interviewed, she's been very good and measured with her responses, but not measured in a way that equivocates or deflects, measured in a way right. that says what she wants to say, but doesn't give in to the person who's trying to prod her into the equivocation. That's like, I can't do that. Like, I don't have that in me. I have many talents, but that's not one of them. So yeah. when I see somebody who can do that and like you said, gets better at it over time, and yeah, can, she keeps getting better. Yeah. Every single fucking speech is like yeah. better than the last. Yeah, I'm with you. I totally agree. I totally so. agree. And, and 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 when again to your point, when you see somebody like that who's, you know, operating, it, she could be operating in a vacuum, <clears throat> but she's operating in a, a very specific time period where the people around her who think like her are all starting to achieve power. And then you have this kind of brain trust on the top who's driving the messaging and the leadership. And you look back at the historical cycles and patterns of when how these things have happened in the past. And it's hard to not think that this isn't something worth putting energy behind. And that's coming from me, somebody who is about as apolitical as humanly possible. I'm kind of into it. And not even just from a social experiment point of view. I'm like really into it. It's very, Me very too. interesting to watch. You it's know? exciting. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's cool. I think so too. Uh, what didn't we touch on that you think we should touch on? <laughs> I don't know. We, we, um, we kind of hit on a lot. I, I, I totally saw this conversation going a completely different direction and we took it in a, a quite a beautiful one. I really enjoyed it. Yes. Um, Me too. Which is really how it should go. I would like to have you on my show sometimes. Yeah. Let let me, uh, yes. Let me fix my video. So here's, so the fucking thing with my video, actually let, let's, let's close the show and I'll tell you after the show about the thing with my video. Um, no, that's great. Uh, Let people know where they can check out your content and, and listen to what you have to offer. Okay. So right now I'm on YouTube I changed the name of my show. It was The Descent. Now it's just Stacy for Truth. Mm-hmm. Easier to search. And I also signed up on Odyssey. So I'm going to start posting videos on Odyssey. And um, also, please check out Pete Quinones' show, Free Man Beyond the Wall. He is awesome. And Scott Horton show. Check out both of them. 
And I guess that's all. That's all I have. Adam, thank you so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, that, that was really uh, that was really awesome. And you're super kind and generous for coming on and having the conversation with me. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. All right, everybody. That's the show for today. Thank you for listening. Thank you to Stacy for coming on and having this conversation with me. For now, be safe, be well, and I will talk to you soon.